Well, I'm glad that you're here today. Thanks for coming and being with us today as we continue on looking at our uh, message through a series of messages through the book of Nehemiah. And we've labeled it Back to Life as, as many things come back to life in the book of Nehemiah, both physical and spiritual things we begin to see. And so today we're at chapter 3, verse 15. We're only going to be reading one verse, even though it goes all the way down to approximately verse 25, verse 26. And we are not going to read all of those names because I can't pronounce half of them and neither can you, all right? So uh, we are coming back to all these names uh, when we get through the gates. But at this point in time, we're just going to look at verse uh, 15 today. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning as we read this verse uh, to, uh, as we read this verse, as we continue on this morning in verse number 15. But he said, But the gate of the fountain repaired Shulan, the son of Kohaza, the ruler uh, part of Mizpah. He built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool by uh, Sila, by the king's garden, up to the stairs that go down by the city of David. And so today we are looking at the fountain gate. Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And again, the thankfulness of having your Holy Spirit within our midst today, within our own hearts. We thank you. And Lord, we just ask as we continue to look through this message, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts on this fountain gate. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And I hope you can see that as we progress through these gates, we see a progression even in our own uh, life as well. And this has been a great journey going through the gates together um, because Jesus is seen at the very beginning. Remember, Jesus was seen as the perfect lamb. He is the one who, as we say, that has came through uh, what we would consider coming through the sheep gate. And it's wonderful to know that we have a Savior that has showed us what agape love looks like. Agape love is the strongest of all loves as seen in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is the agape love that uh, God showed us. Then we begin to see that because Christ came through the sheep gate, we would understand that he, he didn't actually come through the sheep gate the day that he came to the triumphal entry, but probably days that he'd come through there. People didn't make the connection. But because of Jesus Christ being the Savior of the world, the perfect Lamb, people told me about Jesus. I had Sunday school teachers. I had pastors. I've had uh, teachers of, uh, of youth. I've had other people who would speak about Jesus into my life, which shows us the fish gate, tells us about the evangelism, about telling others about Jesus. And then because of humility, because of knowing who I was, because of understanding who Jesus was, I was a person who was born in sin. And because of my sin, I found out that I lived in this valley of sin. And with humility, I bowed and asked Jesus to come into my life. And because of that, I'm now a child of God. And though, even though I'm a child of God, my life still has some valleys. So does yours. But we still look to the Savior. And then what do we need to be saved of? Of course, our sin. That's what we looked at the last time, the dung gate, the filth. That's what it means, the filth, the stench. We understand because of sin, of the, of the stench that it is, it ruins us. But we have a Savior who's able to come and die for you and I and purge our sin because of the finished work at the cross. So the fountain gate is what we're looking at today and its meaning. The fountain gate is located on the south end of the wall. We have been journeying through the city, and in the near future, we'll be heading back around the wall. Scripture has given us detail about this particular fountain. The fountain itself was on the wall of the pool of Shelah, also known by Salah, by the king's garden. We, we know that by Scripture. Scholars believe that the pool of Salah received its water from a subterranean uh, conduit about 1,700 feet long to fill this water uh, or to fill the pool that was in need of water. Scriptures and Kings tells us that when kings died, they were buried in the king's garden. So this was the spot that Nehemiah had also come to the point that when he was traveling that night, that he had to get off his, his mule and then walk the rest of the distance outside the wall. This is where he'd come to. This is how far he, he had gotten. And so there's more Scripture that we're going to look at, but I, I want us to take, look what's taking place and what this fountain means spiritually. 
The first thing I want us to see is the fountain speaks of revelations. In other words, it's going to tell us some things. Many of us know that the Jews were uh, uh, commanded to keep ceremonies along their life of journey from uh, as they gathered together. And many of us know the biggest one is Passover. Uh, A lot of us know Passover is the biggest celebration for the Jews. One for Israel is the Masonic Jews in Israel describes this festival in writings by the following words about the word Sukkot which is an eight-day-long feast. And I I need you to understand that this eight-day feast and what is taking place along the way. According to this, the first evening and the days are special, but the end of this feast is really uh, special as well. And so when we talk about Sukkot, it's it's a Jewish ceremony within a Jewish ceremony. I want you to understand what happens during this place because it draws us to the attention of the revelation of the fountain gate. By the time Jesus uh, had come on the scene, we'd call it a water libation ceremony had been part of the tradition of this festival. This is called the Simchet Bat Hoshavana. It's called the Water Drawing Festival. The priest would go down to the pool of Shalom in the city of David, just south of the western wall is today, and they would fill this golden vessel with water there. They would go up to the temple through the water gate, accompanied by the sound of the shofar, and they would pour water so that it flowed over the altar along with wine from another bowl. And they would begin to make prayers in rain earnest, and that means they were a time of rejoicing as well. They're praying for the future uh, for the rain, but they're praying uh, uh, and they're rejoicing about this ceremony. This is what the Timon says about it. It says, he who has not seen the rejoicing in this place of the water drawing has never seen rejoicing in life. At the conclusion of the first festival day of tabernacles, they descended to the court of the women and they would have this great enactment. They were golden candlesticks with four golden bowls on top of them, four ladders to, to each. They, for, for use, draw from the priestly stock whose hands were held jaw, uh, jars of oil. There was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that was not illuminated by the light of the place of the water drawing. Men of piety, good deeds, used to dance before them with lighted torches with their hands and sing songs and praises. The Levites without number with harps and lyres and cymbals and trumpets and other musical instruments were there upon the 15 steps leading down from the court of the Israelites to the court of the women, corresponding to the 15 songs of the ancient Psalms. And so you may... Preacher, I don't understand exactly what you're saying. That's okay. Just understand this, that in a festival ceremony time, there was a time of water drawing. With a water drawing, it symbolizes their their time of celebration. Matter of fact, the ceremony is based upon the scriptures of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, which says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. And so they took Isaiah, and they took this tradition, and they began to do this uh, water-type ceremony. It's during this Sukkot that in the seventh day, which is the highlighted day of Hoshana Rabbah, is request for great salvation. It's what they're celebrating, this great celebration of salvation. They're asking for God's salvation to, to, to come upon their people. It's the way they called out God. As we continue at the end of the festival, it's followed, it's followed by Shemina Nia Asariet. It's the eighth day of assembly of Shem, uh, Shemkat Torah, which is the joy. See, I had to tell you all this to come to Jesus. Imagine Jesus sitting there. It's the festival time. It's the seventh day. Moving into the eighth day. He is sitting there and he's watching them draw water and celebrating the joy of salvation. With scriptures, this is what we read in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. He said the last day, Remy, seventh and eighth day, the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried. So it's during the ceremony time. It's highly likely during the water drawing period. He's watching this, and Jesus, as he watches this, 
he stands up and he cries out, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me and the scripture has said, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. There were probably people that was there that would turn and look at Jesus as he was the most craziest man there ever was. You see, for years they have drawn this water, crying out for salvation, and Jesus stands up and says, if anybody's thirsty, just come to me. Just come to me. It's so fitting to see that the end of the assembly, this, the assembly is gathered, the day of the pouring of the water, and Jesus speaks to fulfill the Scripture. If any man wants salvation, the invitation is given. It's full and it's free. Sounds great, doesn't it? But remember, Jesus said, if you want salvation, it's not going to come by water that you're drawing from. It's coming through me. Salvation still comes through one person, and that person is Jesus Christ and the finished work through the death, burial, and the resurrection. Scripture is given is, to us the outlook is which the words that Jesus spoke in John chapter 14, 16. He said, I will pray the Father that he shall give you another comforter that he might abide with you forever. See, Jesus knew that his time on end was limited, or his time on earth was limited, and Jesus knew that when he left, there was a comforter coming, and that would begin the work in John chapter 14, verse 26. The comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I say of you. So we see that the Holy Spirit comes into the lives of many at the day of Pentecost. The fountain gate speaks highly of that today even in our life. The fountain gate in which Jesus said and spoke of this living water was speaking of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit and Jesus tells them that he's coming, the comforter. And so we begin to see these things take place. And so we understand that there's this revelation about this gate speaking about the Holy Spirit. The next thing that we see is the fountain gate speaks of restoration. So we think about salvation, we also think about restoration. From the Old Testament, we read in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. So we're talking about the sinful nature, right? We're talking about filled with filth and sin from the dung gate. That's what we talked about. And I know that's not what people like to hear, right? We don't like to describe ourselves as dirty people or filthy people or sinful people. We don't like to describe ourselves like that. But you know what? That's who we are, lost without Christ. And so we read how important God or Jesus is in a person's life. We, we, we read about how important that it is for God or for the Lord to be in somebody's life. We read verses like Deuteronomy 30, 20, Thou mayest love the Lord thy God with mouth, then thou may, uh, mayest obey his voice, that thou may cleave unto him, for he is thy life in the length of his days. Thou may dwell in the land of the Lord, swearing of his fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. You know what? Moses said, you know what? There be, should be one person that we love the most. There should be somebody that we're willing to obey. There's somebody that we need to cleave to, and that is the Lord, because he is the life and the length of our days. In the New Testament, we read in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. This is our life. Why is he our life? Well, Paul said in Colossians 3, 1, if you be risen, been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which Christ setteth on the right hand of God. You see, if we have chosen Christ to be our Savior, he has restored our life in him. If we have truly accepted Christ and been baptized, as Paul said in Colossians 3, 3, for you are dead and your life is hid in Christ God, we're, we're good. Listen, y'all see this? It's a finger, right? Can you see my finger now? You can't see it, but you know it's there, right? Because if it wasn't there, I'd be bleeding right now, okay? You know it's there. You know what? I'm saved. And I'm hidden in Christ. When God the Father looks at me, he doesn't see me. He sees Jesus Christ. Because I'm in him. If us being restored, if I'm restored, if God sent his son to die for me, and because Jesus died for me, he said that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. If I'm saved today and, I, and I'm filled by the Holy Spirit to be restored then I should be looking for the things above. 
We are to seek heavenly things. We are reminded what the Lord said to the disciples, right? He said this in Luke chapter 12, verse 32 and 33. He said to the disciples, he said, I say unto you, don't take thought about your life. Don't worry about what you eat, neither for your body, what you should put on. Life is more than that. Life is more than meat. It's more than the body, more than raiment. He said, consider the ravens, consider the flowers. He said, consider who they are. He said, but you're more than that. He said, in all of this, he said, how little faith do you have? Don't seek what you should eat or what you should drink. Neither be you doubtful in your mind, for these things do the nations of the world seek after. He says, your father already know what the things you need. He said, seek ye the kingdom of God. And all these things that you're at, worried about, they're going to be added to you. And then he says this in verse 34. He says, for where your treasure is, there's your heart be also. You see, our restoration comes, by the way, of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, we, wrote, we read in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, he said, it come to pass afterward that I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. This is what we begin to see. In the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit being poured upon the flesh. Jesus began this restoration by stating to Nicodemus, remember the story with Nicodemus? Nicodemus came at night. I know everybody says, well, Nicodemus came at night. He was afraid, you know, he didn't want nobody to see him. You know, chances are Nicodemus probably came at night because he worked all day. He had been in the court. He had been doing his business of life, got finished and said, you know what? I need to stop by and see this man called Jesus. And the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 3, that Jesus answered and said to him, Very, very, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus explained to Nicodemus that there has to be a restoration in him. There has to be something that takes place. And Jesus went on to say in verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And so he's trying to tell him there has to be something that changes in your life. Now, we know through the Jewish uh, teaching that Nicodemus had said, how can this be possible? How can I go back and how can I be born again to my mother's womb? He was trying to think about this in an irrational way because Nicodemus, being Jewish, had fulfilled everything there ever was to be fulfilled that he thought that allowed him to be someone God would call into heaven. And Jesus said, no. He said in verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hast heard the sound thereof, but thou canst see when it comes and whether it goes. So everyone that is born of the Spirit. You see, we cannot see the Holy Spirit much like we cannot see the wind. We can only see the changes that are produced. And so when it comes to the life of Nicodemus or ourself, we know that we are restored because we read verses like Titus 3, 5, and 6. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy, Holy Ghost, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ is the one who pours out his Holy Spirit so richly upon us. The Holy Spirit who regenerates us, revives us day by day, is shed abundantly through our Savior. We cannot have the Holy Spirit apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who gives us the Holy Spirit. Christ arouses his Spirit to flow through the body of believers and through the church. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, Christ puts his spirit into the new believer. Christ pours out his spirit richly and abundantly upon that person. The result is both a regeneration, a new birth, just like Nicodemus, and a daily renewing revival, stirred to follow Christ and serve him every day. That's how he restores us. The fountain gate speaks of relation. The central power in the life of a believer is the power of the Holy Spirit. Think about this. All the behavior of a believer, all the words of a believer, all the worship of a believer are powerless without the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we get where we read where Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, and be not drunk with wine, we're in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We can debate the words of Paul and, and you know, ab about drinking and being in excess and all that. But let me boil it down to this point. 
Paul said, don't be filled with the world and its intoxication, but rather be filled with the Spirit of God. Remember in Ezekiel 36, 27, he said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues that you shall keep my judgments and do them. Paul wrote to the church in Galatians 5, 16, I say then walk in the spirit and you not shall fulfill the lust of the flesh. In verses, uh, chapter 5, verse 25, he says, we live in the spirit, but we also walk in the spirit. So our relationship with the Holy Spirit is vital. We should be walking in the spirit, but are we? What is our relationship with the Holy Spirit? You see, I think it's very, very vital for us to understand. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not some mystic spirit. Some people have, which you all know where I stand on this, some people said they died and went to heaven and saw this big blue blob. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity of God. He's part of God the Father and Jesus the Son. The Spirit possesses the qualities of the Trinity. You see, he's omnipresent. Psalms 139.7 tells us that. means that he is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. The Bible says that he's omniscient. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. That means that, that he knows all things. He's omnipotent in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, which means that he is powerful. See, he possesses all the qualities of the Trinity. He's eternal, Hebrews 9, 14. He's always been and always will be. So we need to realize that this is a person. It's, a, it's, a, it's someone who has power and a mind. And so that's what we're going to do, and I'm going to go through these quickly. The personality of the Holy Spirit. First of all, he has a mind in Romans 8, 27. The Bible said that he searches the mind in 1 Corinthians 2, 10. The Holy Spirit has a will, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit forbids in Acts chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. But not only does he forbid, the Bible says that he permits. Not only does he permit in Acts chapter 16, verse 10, the Bible says that he speaks in Acts 10, 19. The Bible says that he grieves in Ephesians 4.30. The Bible says the Holy Spirit loves in Romans 15.30. The Bible says that he prays, Romans 8.26. Man, this sounds like a person, doesn't it? In our relationship when it comes to the fountain, Proverbs 13, 14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. It means that he is the spirit of wisdom in Ephesians 1, 17. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. In other words, he is the spirit of life, Romans 8, 2. Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. He's the spirit of glory, 1 Peter 4, 14. Let me say some time this morning and say he's the spirit of truth in John 16, 13. He's the spirit of grace in Hebrews 10, 29. He is the comforter, as we've already mentioned. He's the spirit of promise in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. He's the spirit of adoption in Romans 8, 15. He's the spirit of holiness in Romans 1, 4. He's the spirit of faith in 2 Corinthians 4, 13. And there's so much more to say about the spirit, but I can't say it. Time will not allow can I just tell you how important the Spirit of God is in your life? That he is ready to be active in all at, uh, facets of our life. And as I close, I want to take a couple minutes and just talk about our current position in Christ with the thought of the Holy Spirit. You know, when, 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 when you're a parent... You're just consumed. You're just consumed with your child. You know, when you think about that, can I borrow you for a minute? Can you come here just for a minute? No? Well, one of you come. I can't get a volunteer today. None of you guys volunteer. Come on, Wyatt. Wyatt will come for me. Here comes Wyatt. Come here, Wyatt. I'm going to take you back to when you were a baby, okay? When you were a baby, oh, 
yeah. Lay down, lay down. There you go, there you go, there you go. <laughs> we started this way, right? We started as a baby, you know, we would carry you. I wouldn't carry you. Your mama, your daddy would carry you around, all right? You all right? They'd carry you around, okay? So, so did you know that your mom and dad was consumed with you? That, that's all they thought about. They had to feed you. Yeah, they, they had to feed you. They had to change your diaper. You know, they had to give you a bath. Everybody, everything about their, their time was about you. No, you got to stay here, all right? You got to stay here, okay? So everything was about you. Their whole focus, their whole life was about you, all right? And, and, and that was a great thing. And so, and so it is with Christ. Same as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is passionately seeking all of us in our needs. Is actively pursuing us all the time. And then I know what happens sometimes. Wyatt one day is going to grow up. Oh, come here. Come here. Come here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One day he's going to get bigger. He's going to grow up. Okay? He's going to grow up. And what happens with your kids when they grow up? They, they tend to what? Need less of you, right? They tend to need less of you. And sometimes the relationship that once was, oh, I can't let him go, is let go, right? There's a distance. And sometimes if we're not careful, we start growing in our Christian life. We put this little block between us and the Holy Spirit. Because we think that we've grown up enough that we don't need them. Miss Pam, you have two boys. Stay there, don't move. <laughs> if one of them calls, you'd be there in a heartbeat, wouldn't you? Just like a parent, we're always wanting to be needed. And desire to be wanted. And that's like the Holy Spirit. To desire and to want. So that we're always together. That we're always together. So let me ask you again. What's your position? With Christ this morning and the Holy Spirit. Where is it? Where is he in your life? Okay, you can go now. See, I, I think sometimes we, we look at our life and, and we're doing the things that we want to do rather than being directed and guided by the Holy Spirit. Imagine the Holy Spirit being denied. I think one of the things as a parent is you want to do so much for your children. Listen, my daughter is, she's getting married. And Lily, God bless her, one day might get married. And, and we get to enjoy that relationship. And, and even though they're 23 and 20, there's a part of me that still wants to buy their clothes. There's a part of me that still wants to buy their food for them. There's part of me that still wants to supply their needs. There's part of me that still wants to fulfill that. And you know, I have, it, has, it doesn't happen very often. But could you imagine as a parent that you want to do something for your children so badly that when you asked them, they just said, no, I don't want you to do that for me. And how that hurts. I wonder how the Holy Spirit feels when the Holy Spirit really wants to work in our life and we turn and we say, no, nah, I'm not interested. 
and we grieve the one who's actively pursuing us with such love. So imagine the Holy Spirit feeling the same way, grieved for being denied the opportunity for those who are saved to be the one who pursues them and seeks them out to become something greater than we'd ever imagined. So imagine the Holy Spirit is seeking us out saying, listen, I've got something so much greater for you. There's an opportunity for you to grow. There's an opportunity for you and your relationship with the Lord to really get stronger. Here it is. And we say no. Don't say no this morning. If the Lord is speaking to your heart about salvation, don't say no. Say yes. If you're living your life in Christ and there's things going on in your life, don't say no to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit direct you and guide you to help you to become something greater in your circumstance or your choices. Would you do that this morning? Because Christ died, he saved us, but he did more than that. He said, I'm going to send you a comforter. And this fountain gate, which Jesus stood at that ceremony of festival, saw that water. He said, listen, I'm going to give you something greater. If you're thirsty, come to me, and I'm going to give you a well, a spring of water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about giving us something that will fill us for the rest of our life. How about you this morning? What's your relationship with Christ? and the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come today and to be a part of your word today, to see it come alive and see how you saw things that you would give a piece of information and people did not understand it. Only in my mind's eye can I even imagine what it might have been like at that festival as you watch them do this water drawing and how they were celebrating and how they thought this was the greatest thing ever as they called out to God for salvation. And there in the midst of them where you were standing and you stood up and you talked about this well that could gush, this water that would quench them, this thirst that could be quenched. And you talked about yourself, but you talked about sending of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I I can only imagine that that crowd just thought that you were probably just crazy. But those words were so prophetic. Because you told the disciples, when I I leave this place, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you someone who's going to be with you every step of the way. And Lord, maybe today, maybe today somebody needs to draw from that well of salvation. Maybe today we need to draw back to the Holy Spirit to speak to our heart and our life. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Speak to us as we sing a song of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing a verse of invitation today. All to Jesus I surrender all To Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence day